Let me get, begin by saying how grateful I am to have been here, to um, have been blessed to share the platform with um, some of the other speakers. I, the Doyles are some of my absolute favorite people in the world. Like I can just listen to their stories. I love them so much. Um, and I, I feel very comfortable sharing what I'm about to share regarding the sort of negative reality concerning Islam because I know that the Doyles thoroughly covered the application, the Christ-like response. One of the greatest dangers of, for any teacher is conveying something that's not thoroughly qualified and balanced and then having people run with it and take it further than you did in getting off into excesses and errors. And the danger, every message sort of has a way in which their message can be abused. And the way that my message regarding Islam can often be misused is people, if, if I'm not careful, they can run away with fear and hatred of Muslims. And that is the last thing that I want in terms of the application and the response to my material. I want people to understand the reality, the days that we're in. But I don't want them to get into fear and hatred because that's counterproductive because our job is to love them as Christ loved us and to reach them with the gospel so that they would be reconciled to God in the same way that the Lord opened our eyes when we were still his enemies. So the title of this afternoon's session is the introduction, the intro to the Islamic paradigm. You could simply say the Islamic theory. Uh, essentially what uh, we'll be discussing is the idea that the Antichrist, his empire and his system or his religion will come out of the Middle East, out of the Middle East and North Africa, the nations that surround Israel, as opposed to out of Europe, which is the most popular sort of end time teaching. Uh, as I began with uh, the message yesterday, I said, look, the Bible is and always has been thoroughly Jerusalem-centric. The book is written in Israel. The stories all revolve around Israel, around Jerusalem, Israel, Judea, and the larger Middle East. And outside of that, the rest of the world is, it's really just vaguely referenced here and there. Uh, I mean, nations like the United States, you know, people go, where is the United States clearly specified? And people argue about a few passages, this or that. But really, the best that you can really nail down is where it says things like, those who are at ease in the coastlands, you know, just kind of like way out on the peripheral of the, uh, the biblical worldview. So once we begin with that understanding, the context of the book that we're trying to interpret, then I've got, throw that first map up that you started with. I begin with a map where all of the nations in black are the predominant Muslim majority nations. Now again, I, oh, the star's a little bit off there. The, the throne of David will not be in central Cairo, I'm um, central Egypt, <laughs> south of Cairo. Um, so if the star was up there in Israel, that's, again, the spot where Yeshua will come back to rule the nations from, from Israel. That is the spot where God has chosen to govern the universe from, in the flesh. I mean, it's just the most amazing thing. And then you look at the nations that surround Israel, and they are all Muslim-majority nations. Now, I always like to ask the question, I say, what has more relevance to the context of the scriptures, the Middle East and North Africa, the Muslim-majority world, or Europe? Now, it's not to say that Europe doesn't have relevance. I'm just saying which has more relevance. Okay, so we begin just by sort of, you know, as Americans, most of us Americans, refreshing our mind with a map because we are infamous for being completely cartographically illiterate, I don't know, map illiterate. When we were at war in Iraq, 85% of Americans didn't know where Iraq was. I'm going, you're kidding me, you know? Um, does anybody know where Bhutan is? <laughs> oh, some people do. Um, that's a tough one. How do you spell Kyrgyzstan? No, just kidding. Um, that's a hard one. So <clears throat> we'll begin with the first verse, Joel 3. So in order to demonstrate this point that the Antichrist, his empire, and his religion will come from the Middle East, we begin with some very simple passages. We're beginning with geography. We're just doing a simple survey of biblical geography. What does the Bible say? 
And so here you have a passage in Joel 3, the context of which is clearly the day of the Lord, the return of Jesus. It's the end times. And what does the Lord say? He says, hasten and come, all of you surrounding nations. It's a very specific phrase. Goyim uh, seviv, the, the, the Gentiles round about. And when it says surrounding, it means around Israel. It's, it's a very you know, clear phrase. And gather yourselves there. So all of you neighbors, if you will, all of the neighbors around Israel, gather yourself. Bring down your warriors, O Lord. Let the nations stir themselves up and come to the valley of Jehoshaphat. For there I will sit to judge, again, the surrounding nations. Now, in some other statements, it will say all nations. But here's the thing that we need to recognize, is oftentimes the Bible very commonly uses something called hyperbole. Eastern language is filled with hyperbole. Eastern language is often sort of very um, flamboyant in its exaggeration. You know, if you want to welcome someone into your house, it's like, come, you know, you're welcome into my house. My firstborn is yours. You go, wait, what? And all you're really doing is inviting him in to have dinner. But, you know, like kind of these over-the-top type of statements. I'm, I'm even exaggerating with that a bit. But when it'll make a statement like all, sometimes we as Westerners, we like to like dissect the word of God and impose this rigid, almost scientific, uh, literalistic meaning to every term. And let me just give you an example. Actually, it's probably an easier one. In the days of Caesar Augustus, a census went out that all the world should be t- taken a census and go up to Bethlehem. All the world. And the hyper wooden literalist goes, well, that must mean that everyone in Papua New Guinea, back in Canada at the time, wherever there was people, they all had to go to Bethlehem. It was the Roman Empire. It was just those within the Roman Empire needed to, be, actually, that was just in Judea had to go up to Bethlehem, but there was a census of all of the Roman Empire. But if there was Chinese dynasties, there were people all over the world at that point, vibrant. They did Chinese... The Chinese didn't have to come to do a census, but it says all the world. There's numerous, numerous examples like this. So it begins with the the hyperbolic statement, but then it brings clarity in statements like this when it says you surrounding nations. That's when it becomes a bit more specific. Okay, and so when it says surrounding nations, what does it mean? It means the nations round about. So likewise in Zechariah 12 verse 2, very similar statement. Behold, I am about to make Jerusalem a cup of staggering to all of the Amsaviv, the peoples round about. Um, the siege of Jerusalem will be against Judah. Again, the context is the day of the Lord, and he's saying the peoples that come against Israel are going to be the surrounding peoples. Now, the popular end time sort of scenario often basically says there's going to be like a Psalm 83 war, and then there's going to be this separate, distinct Ezekiel 38, 39, Gog, Magog war, and all the Muslims of the Middle East are going to get annihilated and wiped out, and they're all going to go away, and then the Antichrist from Europe comes down later, right? The problem is the scriptures say the nations that will invade Israel in the last days are the surrounding nations. So what, how, how, how does that work? You know, we have to simply take passages like this at face value and emphasize that which the scriptures clearly emphasize. Look at this. This is, it begins to get more specific. Now, for clarity, this is just sort of a very quick overview. We could look at dozens upon dozens of passages throughout the prophets, throughout the Bible, where the prophets name names. They point to nations, peoples, tribes, and they are very specific. Now, the problem with The Bible naming all these names is that most of us, as incredibly responsible students of the scriptures, we open up the Bible, we open up especially the Old Testament, and, you know, we're just, let me just see if I can, I can't even hardly see my Bible anymore, but we'll just find a passage. The nations hear and tremble, anguish will grip the people of Philistia, the chiefs of Edom will be terrified, the leaders of Moab will be seized with trembling, the people of Canaan. And we go, I have no idea where Edom, Moab, Canaan is, and we just go, do 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 moving on. Like, we just keep reading, We're, and we, something in our head just goes, Old Testament names, bant, 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 and we don't even stop and actually try to figure out what's being said. And so we have to stop and do that. Now, Ezekiel 30 is a pretty clear end time day of the Lord passage. Thus saith the Lord God, wail, cry 
alas for the day, the day. This is such a common, repeated motif throughout the scriptures, the day of the Lord. And it's always a time of doom for the Gentiles, a time of gloom, wail, cry out. That day will come like a, like a, uh, like burn like a furnace. For the day is near, the day of the Lord is near. It will be a time of clouds, a time of doom for the Gentiles. A sword will come upon France, right? No, it says Egypt. We know what Egypt is. That name hasn't changed from ancient times till today. Um, how do they say Egypt in uh, Arabic? It's, um, wait, where's, where's my um, Druzy friend? She, did she leave? Oh. oh, there you are. How do you say Egypt? Mosul. Uh, and, but in Cairo is Kaharun? How do you say Cairo? Kahara. The city of like destruction or something. So, but somehow Egypt is still translated consistently down through, down through time. Uh, so we know what Egypt is. Anguish will be in Cush. Again, the context is the day of the Lord, very clearly. What is Cush? Most translations say Ethiopia. Now, I love the Ethiopians, and I have to stand up for my Ethiopian friends and go, actually, that's a bad translation. Cush, biblically, is immediately south of Egypt. In modern times, that would be northern Sudan. Um, Modern-day Ethiopia is ancient Abyssinia. There's kind of some weird historical thing, and then the Ethiopians always get this bad name. So I just have to be clear. When it says Cush, some, some Ethiopians will say, well, we're all Cushites, like ethnically. They identify with that old, you know, because of the Queen of Sheba and all that. But if we're talking geography, Cush is basically where the rivers that lead into the Nile split, and that corresponds loosely with modern-day Khartoum, the capital of, of northern Sudan. When the slain will fall in Egypt. So again, it reiterates Cush, and then it says Put, Lud, Arabia. So now when we see Put, Lud, we don't know what that means. We skip Arabia. We go, oh, okay, we know that. Put is essentially northern uh, Africa. Lud is Lydia. That's Turkey, western Turkey, western Asia Minor. And then all of Libya, again, that's sort of a more restrictive portion of North Africa. And the people of the land, and it specifies them as being in league. There is a coalition, there is an empire, there is a unity among all of these peoples, and this is not a comprehensive list, it says they will fall by the sword. So, just for clarity, in the context of the day of the Lord, you have a coalition of nations, yeah, and here's a map which kind of gives you a picture of Ezekiel 30. And it's Egypt, it's Sudan, it's North Africa, it's Turkey, it's Arabia. It doesn't say anything about Europe. A great coalition coming against. How is it that they're still alive if they all got wiped out in Ezekiel 38, 39? And my point is this, is that Gog, Magog, Ezekiel 38, 39, is the Antichrist. They're not two separate wars. This is what interpreters do. They go, okay, well, we know the Antichrist gathers together a massive coalition of nations and invades the land of Israel and attacks. Ezekiel describes a massive coalition of nations that gathers together and attacks Israel, led by someone named Gog. But then they go, but these are all Middle Eastern nations. And we previously know that the Antichrist comes from Europe. Therefore, these must be two different invasions. The problem is there's this glaring assumption we know the Antichrist must be European. And he's not. The prophets are all basically telling the same general story. It's not that complicated. It's really not that hard. If we simply take the time to look at what the prophets are saying, they're all telling the same story, emphasizing different aspects of that story. Yes, just like the Gospels, you know, they're all pointing to different elements, but it's the same general story. A massive coalition of nations, primarily from the Middle East and North Africa, maybe many, many others, we don't know. Where the Bible is silent, we should be silent. But here's the thing. Every single time that the Bible names names, mentions people's tribes, regions, every single one, every single verse, every single time is a North African or Middle Eastern nation. 
and there is not a single reference to a European nation involved in the Antichrist coalition. Does that mean that none will be involved? Absolutely not. Let me repeat. Where the Bible is silent, we need to be very careful. What the Bible emphasizes, we should emphasize. And yet we have this all of these prophecy books. And again, I want to be clear. I am not saying I am right. This is the way. All these guys are wrong. That's not my point. I'm personally convinced. I think it makes way more sense when we open the scriptures and we look at what's clearly there. We look out in the world and we go, this stuff's actually real. And it's actually quite specific. And it's happening right now. Now, I don't know how many of you in the room are pre-trib, and, and please, you know, don't take anything I'm saying as critical if you are. That's not the point at all. But the majority of the church that holds to and embraces the end times as an important matter, probably about 65 right now to 70% embrace the pre-tribulational, the idea that we are raptured before the tribulation. Now, there's something that happens with that, and I just it's a dynamic, and I want to mention it. When you have this thing in, in your imagination concerning the future, that suddenly millions of people are going to disappear. That opens up within our prophetic imagination of the future. It opens up the door for incredible imaginative scenarios. And when you read so many books about the end times, they, there's, there can often be wild speculation. People are like, well, wait a minute, here's an idea. Have you ever thought about this? I mean, it only makes sense. And there's a lot of you know, reason and imagination and logic. And I'm not picking on it because it's quite a natural thing. They go, when suddenly millions of people disappear and there are no true professing Christians preaching the gospel, just false Christians, that's when the aliens are going to show up and deceive the whole world with their new religion. And there's just, you know, any number of all kinds of scenarios that are present. People go, wow, I never thought of that. That makes sense because there's all these new, you know, UFO uh, sightings or this, that, or the other thing. And others, you know, there's a million different theories. But here's the thing is that it's because of this imagination thing, we've almost taken the whole issue of the end times. And a lot of people look at it and we go, why don't pastors talk about the end times? Let me tell you this story to demonstrate what I'm trying to communicate. I was working for this gal, and because um, I had a decorative painting company for 20 years, and I was saying, well, I also do ministry a little bit on the side, you know. And she's like, oh, that's interesting. And written some books, and well, what do you write about? Well, end times. She's, oh, I love. It. She's a Christian. Um, she goes, I love the end times. I love all that stuff. I love science fiction. I love the end times. She linked those two together. And this is what we've done. Look, the Bible is talking about tomorrow or 10 years down the road, and that's real. That's real. Like, that's what we're going to experience on the earth. But somehow we think there's going to be this magic button that gets pushed, and the entire world that we know is going to cease to exist, and any crazy thing that we can imagine is suddenly going to happen. And yet there's something that's right in front of us. It's been here for 1,400 years. People are being beheaded, they're being killed, they're being run out of the Middle East. It has all of the telltale signs of what the Bible describes as the Antichrist, the anti-Semitic spirit, the hatred of, of the Jewish people, this anti-Zionist lust to possess the land, the promised land, the anti-Christic hatred of Christians. It's got all of the markers and we go, yeah, but they all get wiped out probably any day now. And then the aliens or whatever it might be. And I'm kind of going, all right, look, I'm, I understand how fun it is to speculate, but it's, it can almost be a little bit like the Christian version of like, <sighs> dude, have you ever imagined what it would be like if all of a sudden aliens just showed up and deceived the whole world? You know what I mean? It's almost like that. Sorry. And I'm going, it's right in front of us. And we will have all these conferences to discuss all of this crazy possibilities. And I'm going, it's time that we develop an action plan to rise to meet the Goliath that's right in front of us. Because now is the time. We're 10 years behind. We are at least 10 years behind. 
and we're still sort of living in this fantasy world. Someday, the, you know, cra- Oprah's going to send out an email, and everyone's just going to be like, the new religion, I'm signing up, or whatever. We're waiting for something new. We don't know what it is. It's going to bring everyone together, and I'm going, guys, that which the prophets described, it's already here. Now, again, could I be wrong? Yeah, I could be wrong. I don't pretend to be a prophet. I don't pretend to have knowledge of the future. I'm just doing my best to peer into the scriptures and say, guys, this seems to be kind of saying something clearly. And your job as Bereans is to peer into the scriptures and study these things carefully and do, do the same, right? And make, your own, make up your own mind. So now we'll skip forward to Joel 3. Joel 3, verse 2 and 4. Again, the Lord says, I will gather all the nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat. There I will enter into judgment against them concerning my inheritance, my people Israel. The final battle, it it concerns Jerusalem. That's where it all culminates. Why? Because they scattered my people among the nations. They divided up my land. There's another reference to the last days scattering. It's not to say that all of the Jews will be scattered, but there is a scattering. And then the Lord says this, and notice interestingly how the Lord identifies with his people. They might be majority in rebellion, but the Lord still identifies. And so the the Gentiles are coming against his people, even though the majority are in rebellion. And the Lord says, what have you against me? In the same way that in Isaiah 53, the Lord identifies with his people. He's doing this throughout the scriptures. He goes, okay, Gentiles, what have you got? What problem do you have with me, the creator of the universe? And they go, no, 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 we like you, God. We just don't like these Yehudis. And God goes, no, your problem is with me because those are my covenant people. And then he names names, O Tyre and Sidon. That's Lebanon, Hezbollah. Okay. Now, I want to be clear. The Lord, it's, the Lord doesn't dislike Lebanese. Amen? The Lord loves Lebanese. What the Lord, his anger is against is those who allow their hearts to become vessels of hatred against his covenant people. The, the, Ezekiel describes it as the everlasting hatred against his everlasting covenant. His everlasting covenant is his promised plan of redemption. He's going to restore all of this mess. He's going to fix it. He's going to restore the cosmos. All of creation is going to be beautified and glorified. And there is a satanic propaganda in the earth that is trying to provoke mankind to function in hatred against the unfolding of that promised plan. And God says, if humans allow their hearts to become vessels of hatred against my covenant people, against my promised land, then I will judge them. Now, it just so happens that these parts of the world happen to be some of the the primary places where this propaganda is welcomed and embraced. But believe me, this is not a racial or national issue. God loves Lebanese. He loves Lebanon. And then he goes, and all you regions of Philistia. God loves the Palestinians. He loves everyone, but he will bring judgment upon those who allow themselves actually To make it very clear, the Lord, this is not a racist issue. The Lord is going to judge racism against his people. That's really, it's not merely racism. It's deeper. It's it's, it's a greater spiritual issue. But it is a demonic racism. And then he goes, are you repaying me for something I have done? And again, they're going, no, our problem was with the Jews. And he goes, no, listen, if you think you're paying me back, then all of the violence that you've brought, it's going to be swiftly brought back onto your own head. Payback is coming. This is biblical karma. Biblical karma is going to get you, darling. <clears throat> That's why I don't sing. Micah 5, the Assyrian. This is a huge one. But you, Bethlehem Ephrathah. So this is the famous messianic prophecy, classic messianic prophecy. It speaks of where Jesus would be born. But you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, even though you're, you're, you're just small among the clans of Judah. You're not great enough to be considered a tribe. You're just small clan. Nevertheless, despite your insignificance, out of you will come one for me who will be ruler over Israel. You know the one that God was speaking of when he spoke to King David and he says, I will raise up your seed after you lie down and his kingdom will have no end. The guy who he said to Isaiah, unto us a child is born. He goes, yeah, that one, he's going to be born in Bethlehem. He will be the ruler over Israel. His origins are from of old, from ancient times. 
He will stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. So what will this Bethlehem-born Messiah do? According to Micah, again, it's a few verses later, it's, does it say he will heal the sick? He will gently lead, you know, and no, it doesn't emphasize, he will do all those things. It doesn't, no, it says this, he will deliver us from the Assyrian when the Assyrian invades our land and marches into our borders. And you can read the rest of that chapter. It's very clear. So do you guys, you're familiar, of course, with the um, episode in the Gospel of Luke where Jesus leads a military campaign and delivers Israel from the invasion of the Assyrians. You know that, that part? It's not there, is it? Micah said, the Lord said through Micah that Jesus, the Bethlehem-born Messiah, would lead a military victory over an individual that it calls the Assyrian when he marches into our land and crosses into our borders. That's the Antichrist. In the earliest commentary that we have on the book of Revelation written by Victorinus, um, he actually multiple times refers to the Assyrian as the Antichrist. Um, likewise, Isaiah refers to the Assyrians or the Assyrian as that antichristic last days army. Now, there's kind of a spectrum in terms of how we can interpret what does that mean. Because the Lord, yes, he was using the ancient pagan looming pagan ruler of the day and pagan army of the day as a prototype for the Antichrist. So yes, he was using something in history. Um, and so, you know, there is that. But some people who are demand a rigid literalism, they go, no, the Antichrist will be an ethnic Assyrian. Now, of course, most Assyrians today are Catholic, Middle Eastern uh, Assyrian or Chaldean Catholics. And so, you know, that's a little bit weird. But um, it was using the ancient Assyrians as the prototype. But some people could say, the Antichrist is going to be a bloodline. You know, it's a, I don't, I, in my opinion, that's taking it too rigidly literal. And then there are those who kind of just go, hey, it really doesn't mean anything. Assyrian, well, he's just using the ancient bad guys, and it just means the bad guys. But we shouldn't read anything into the term the Assyrian. I go, no, you know, I think both of these are probably bad interpretive extremes. I think somewhere in the term the Assyrian, the Lord is probably pointing to something. And, and, and I believe that also because many of the other passages that speak of the Antichrist have them coming from that general area where the Assyrians once ruled. Daniel 11, Daniel 8, you know, the little horn, the king of the north, etc., etc., but so I would argue, I would ask, let me put it this way, I would ask, is it more reasonable to conclude that since the Antichrist is repeatedly referred to as the Assyrian, that he probably at the very least will come out from the region of the former Assyrian Empire, as this map shows, the Assyrian Empire at the time of its greatest extent, is that more reasonable of a, of a way of interpreting this, or is it more reasonable to conclude that he will be, go to the next slide, Nicolae Carpathia from Romania. As the, it's over 50 million copies were sold in the series. And, you know, again, I want to be real clear. I'm not picking on Tim LaHaye. He, he was one of the most humble, genuine leaders that I had ever met. Um, really humble guy. And I actually talked to him about this issue. And he specifically said, he goes, the reason that he chose Nicolae Carpathia to be his his fictional Antichrist from Romania is because he believed the Antichrist had to be of Roman ethnic descent. And he said the Romanians are the, the best um, natural, strangely, not the Italians, um, extension of the, uh, of the Romans. And I think there is some sort of, you know, historical background. For, but that was his basis for that. I don't know if he ever explained that anywhere. But again, how can someone from Romania be the Assyrian? Unless that term just means nothing at all, unless we just throw it away or go to the next slide or how could one of these guys be the Assyrian? How could anyone with a smile that big be the Antichrist, you know? Now, I want to be clear, you know, it doesn't mean that they're not Antichrists, but personally, in my opinion, I don't think that either of them meets the biblical criteria. I don't know how you can make one of them become the Assyrian, unless you say that word just means nothing at all, unless you just sort of throw it outside of the Bible. 
So again, that's my opinion. Anything could happen. Time could, you know, show me wrong. But personally, I don't. I don't personally see it. Now we're going to shift to the major pillar of the Roman Antichrist perspective. Okay, because the entire idea that the Antichrist is going to come from Rome is built on two pillars, Daniel 2 and Daniel 9, 26, and 27. We're not going to get into the 9, 26, and 27, the people of the prince to come. But Daniel 2, Daniel's, um, well, it's Nebuchadnezzar's statue. Nebuchadnezzar being the king of ancient Mesopotamia. Let me look where I am time-wise. And so let's begin by looking at um, a picture of the statue. So King Nebuchadnezzar, who was the ruler of ancient Mesopotamia, modern-day Iraq and that whole, um, that whole kind of area, he had a dream. The dream greatly concerned him. It disturbed him. And so he goes to all of his astrologers, wise men, enchanters, and he goes, okay, guys, I want you to tell me not only the meaning of my dream, I want you to tell me what the dream itself was. And they're just like, great, we're dead, you know. And um, they're terrified. So they, and this happens a couple times in the book of Daniel, but they go, hey, there's one of those Hebrew exiles, and he's really gifted in those things, so let's call him. And so Daniel comes, and he says to the king, he goes, yep, let it be known. There's a God in heaven that reveals these things. And it's this particular God. He reveals these things. Give me a night to sleep on it. Nebuchadnezzar says, okay, go do it. Daniel goes. The Lord reveals him the dream. He comes before the king. He goes, king, this is your dream. And believe me, the moment that he tells the king his dream, his own dream, he got the king's attention. You know, I mean, I've seen this kind of thing in my life where someone speaks who has a genuine prophetic gift, and there's a lot of people out there who think they do and don't, and they say something, and you go, no one other than God could know that. And it's like a really weird feeling. It's one of those examples when God opens the curtains and goes, peekaboo. You're like, you're telling people about me. Stop gossiping. No. So... He presents to the king the interpretation of the dream, and he listens. He goes, you, O king, are the, you know, the king of kings. The God of heaven has given you power and authority. And he goes, you are the head of gold. So you have this statue. That's what the dream was about. And the traditional, actually go back to the statue again. The traditional interpretation of the statue is this. They go, Nebuchadnezzar, the king and his kingdom, Babylonian empire, is the head of gold. And then you go down to the, the chest and the arms of silver, and that's the Medo-Persian Empire. Now, the book of Daniel actually mentions the first three empires by name. Then the next one is the Alexandrian uh, Hellenistic Greek Empire. That's from the, 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 the belly and the thighs all the way down to the knees of bronze. Some of the old translations say copper. Then you have the legs of iron, and everyone knows that's the Roman Empire, and the reason we know is because when we turn to our Bibles in the subheadings, it says the Roman Empire. <laughs> right? Open your Bible. It never says the name of this fourth kingdom. Daniel never mentions it anywhere. It's not in the text. But everyone has always assumed. Why? Now, here's an interesting little something to chew on. We here in the West, in the United States, we trace our history through the Roman Empire, as does the whole Western world. Now, there are different ways of interpreting history. When I visit with my friends from Iran, and I say, what empire came after Alexander, after Alexander's Greek Empire, they go, well, then came the, the Parthians, or the Sassanids. And they mention a Persian Empire, and I'm like, no, dummies! The Roman Empire came. They go, yeah, from your perspective, from the Western perspective, but your Western lens of interpreting history is not the only lens, and in fact, it's not necessarily the biblical lens. And so we just sort of assume that the Bible is coming from the Western lens of history, but there's many different ways of looking at these things, and we have to ask, what would Nebuchadnezzar's primary vantage point been? Because he's the one that the dream was given to. And then the idea is that the feet of iron and clay, that that is the revived Roman Empire. I'm going to look at some of the reasons why that is very problematic. I'm going to argue that the legs of iron is actually the Islamic Empire. 
And people go, but it has to have continuity. You can't have any breakup. Yet, the traditional position has a 1,500-year gap between the ankles and the feet and all these other empires in between. And they go, yeah, but you can't do that. They go, but you're doing it. Yeah, but you can't. <laughs> the point is this. It speaks of a series of global empires, and it makes it very clear. They would be the empires that come after and crush Nebuchadnezzar's empire. They were relevant to Nebuchadnezzar. That is the context of the vision. That is who the dream was given to. And that is the geographic context of the passage. And we have to pay attention to it from its own terms, not from our lens. And we have to look at some of the indicators within the text, which make it very clear what it's talking about. Because the only other real empire in history, there are only two potential candidates, either the Roman Empire or the Islamic Empire. There's really no others that you can try to say, well, this one could qualify, because they don't. Those are the only two possible candidates. So we begin with Daniel 2, verse 40. And here, um, it speaks of the fourth kingdom. Again, it never names the kingdom. It just calls it the fourth kingdom, the fourth kingdom. And then it talks about the fourth kingdom, and it gives us criteria through which to identify the fourth kingdom. And it says this, the fourth kingdom... It will be as strong as iron, and as much as iron breaks in pieces and crushes and shatters everything, like iron that crushes, that kingdom will break in pieces and crush all of the others. So a kingdom is coming which will crush and break Babylon, Medo-Persia, and Greece. All of the others. Now you can say, but Joel, you just said all doesn't mean all. There's only three. You know, it's not like it's like, well, it only really meant two. You know, I mean, like here it's pretty clear. When it says all the others, it obviously means all three of the others. So the kingdom will be one that crushes Babylon, Medo-Persia, and Greece. So you go between the two, between the Roman Empire and the Islamic Empire. Which one meets the criteria or the criterion of Daniel 2 verse 40? Now, the other passage, which is similar to this, because that spoke of the rise of the empire. When it rises, it would crush all the others. In verses 33 through 35, it speaks of the demise of the fourth kingdom. When it's destroyed, it will also, by virtue of its destruction, all of the other kingdoms will be destroyed at the same time. It basically says the same thing twice, but from different ends of its existence. And so Daniel says, you continued looking until a stone was cut out without human hands. So there's this mysterious stone that's cut out of a mountain or something, and the stone strikes the statue specifically on the feet of iron and clay, and it crushes them. What happens at that moment? The iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, the gold were crushed all at the same time. When the final fourth empire is destroyed, Babylon, Medo-Persia, and Greece will all be destroyed all at the same time. And they become like dust. They blow away and there's nothing left. So now let's look at a map. We'll begin with the Babylonian Empire. I put a dot on Babylon. That's where the dream was given. That was Nebuchadnezzar was the king of Babylon. Again, basically corresponds to modern day Iraq. The blue area, that was sort of the whole area that he controlled at the time. And he goes, you are the head of gold, but after you, another kingdom is coming. Now we go to the next map, you have the Medo-Persian Empire, massive empire. The Medes and the Persians, Darius and Cyrus, you know, sort of, the, they were joined together, and it was massive. It extended all the way up into Europe, over there in the west, all the way down into uh, North Africa, into Egypt, all the way over to there to India. I mean, it was a massive, massive empire. And if you're Nebuchadnezzar, you go, so does this empire qualify as the one that comes after you? And it is, in fact, it was actually his son, Belshazzar, who's getting drunk, drinking out of the temple utensils the very night that um, Darius the Mede came and took his kingdom. And so Nebuchadnezzar would go, yeah, absolutely, clearly, that's the kingdom that comes after mine. That's the chest and arms of silver. And then what's the next kingdom? The next map is the Grecian Empire, the Alexandrian, Macedonian kingdom, which this one comes from Europe and sweeps all the way across the Middle East and it actually expands the Medo-Persian Empire a bit all the way over there to the Hindu Kush. Again, does that qualify as the next one that would come after you? Is that relevant to Nebuchadnezzar? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Then we get to the Roman Empire. 
all of a sudden, everything shifts west. Everything shifts west. Now, um, how many grew up watching Sesame Street? How many never watched Sesame Street growing up? How many parents didn't let them watch Sesame Street because they were homeschooled? <laughs> you guys. Um, so there's this one thing in Sesame Street where they break up the screen and they'll, they'll have like one kid throwing a ball and then another one, he's bouncing a ball and then another one, he's kicking a ball and then there's another one like with a hula hoop or something and it'll go like, one of these kids is unlike the others, one of these kids is on his own or something. I always blow it. I should probably look it up on YouTube. They'll be like, man, you really, you ruined, what was the other song I sang? Um, you ruined everything. But... Um, Here's the thing is with the Roman Empire, it's kind of like that. One of these empires is not like the others. You've got these Middle Eastern Empire, Middle Eastern Empire that controls and crushes Babylon. It comes after Nebuchadnezzar, and all of a sudden everything goes and goes, it goes toward Europe. Now, to be clear, here's the thing with empires is they're constantly changing. The borders are in flux. There's wars. There's battles. There's border skirmishes. When you go online and you say, like, the Roman Empire, the time of its greatest extent, there was a very short period in AD 113 when under Emperor Trajan that it extended much further into the Middle East. In fact, Trajan wanted to be the next Alexander the Great. He came down the Tigris and he conquered the ruins of ancient Babylon. Within weeks, this is what's amazing, within weeks he had a stroke and his emperor Hadrian had some problems back in what was Palestine, and he came back and died. So literally, here's another map of the Roman, uh, oh, skip two slides forward. Oh, it's AD 116, I'm sorry. That is the Roman Empire at the time of its greatest extent that lasted for several months. So again, you kind of go, well, wait, 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 wait. Now, did the Roman Empire crush all the others or not? And you go, Kind of, I mean, sort of, for a few months there. But to Nebuchadnezzar, is this the crushing empire? Is this the one? Is this the biggie that was coming? And you go, I don't know. It's hard to say, like, sort of yes, sort of no. But you sort of have to shoehorn it, shoehorn it in to make it fit. But really, after Trajan died, Hadrian moved that borders back because he was dealing with the Parthians. They were the Persians. And they were kind of like... Um, guerrilla warfare, you know, and they couldn't deal with it. And he just said, from now on, the border of the Roman Empire is going to be way back here. And he gave up what was called Armenia. He gave up what was Babylon. And it, they only held it for a few months, like literally less than a year. And so, you know, it's in terms of what was the Roman Empire most of its time, it was the first map that I showed you. And that wasn't very relevant to Nebuchadnezzar. Now, go back to the slide of the Islamic Caliphate. In the 7th century, you know, Islam is born, Muhammad dies, his followers, successors burst forth out of Arabia, and like lightning, they decimate the ancient church throughout the Middle East. All of the great missionary sending capitals of Antioch, Alexandria, Jerusalem, all of the seven churches, I mean, they were just wiped out. And what took place in those early conquests was virtually identical to what we've just witnessed the past few years with ISIS except much worse, much bigger. You know, the number of, of just rapes and pillaging and cities leveled and carrying. You read the Islamic sources. Uh, Imam al-Waqidi's The Conquest of Syria. You read some of the Christian scholarship that goes into that period, and it's brutal. The battles, I mean, it's really just like ISIS. People go, oh, no, Islam's a religion of peace. And I go, you really haven't been doing your homework. I know that you want to believe that, but that doesn't make it the case. So look at this statement from George Rawlinson. Go past the uh, maps. And he's referring to the Roman Empire's ability to crush that whole area of Babylon. And he says this, There was no soil beyond the Euphrates in which the Roman institutions could take root, while the expense of maintaining them would have been utterly exhausting. And when he says that, he's referring to the Euphrates up in Syria, not all the way down into Iraq. Because again, the Parthians were a pretty great empire. And it's almost like the forgotten empire. Because again, for us, everything is Rome. You know, We trace our law and our history and all kinds of things through Rome. But you had this other empire right there that it was a great challenge to the Romans. But then the Parthians sort of morphed into the Sassanids. And then came 
Islam. It was really the next major, and the Parthians were sort of just like a residual leftover from the old Persian Empire. It was just like they were the remaining Persians. But then the next empire that came along was the Islamic Empire. And so when you ask, oh yeah, so here's another map. So what I did there is I said, did the Roman Empire crush all the others? So if you add all the others up, you know, you combine them all, and then you overlay the part of the Roman Empire that crushed all the others, it's about a quarter. And it says the fourth empire would crush all of the others. Did it crush all the others? Because I asked my Iranian friends, I say, did the Roman Empire crush you? And they're like, no, of course not. But the Bible says that the, Ro the fourth empire would crush all the others. And they're like, no, the Roman Empire didn't crush us. Alexander came through, and then the next major thing that came along was Islam. You know? And it's actually, well, I won't get into that. It's interesting. They, um, my Iranian friends thought Plato was Iranian. Because they're like, they're like, our Plato? I'm like, no, you, he, that was brought by Greece. And they go, oh, but we're all taught Plato. Because the Hellenization reached all the way over to Iran. So now skip forward to Daniel, uh, it says Islam, the crushing empire. Daniel 7, verse 7. In chapter 7, I'm supposed to be done at what time? 240? Okay. There's another statement in chapter 7. Chapter 7 of Daniel is telling the same story as Daniel 2, but it's using different symbolism. It's using the symbolism of four beasts instead of the statue. And so the fourth beast of Daniel 7 is the fourth kingdom of Daniel 2. And there's just a little bit of a point here that I want to make, and it's describing the fourth beast, the fourth kingdom. Daniel said, after that in my night vision I looked, and there before me was a fourth beast, terrifying and frightening, very powerful. It had large iron teeth. And then it makes this statement, I find this interesting. It crushed and devoured its victims... And then after it devours its victims, it tramples the residue that's left. Now, when Muhammad died, his successors conquered the whole Middle East. This heart of the ancient Christian church was ripped out. Millions killed within 10 years. And then you have, over the next 1,400 years, a struggling remnant of traditional Christians there in the Middle East. And then you have ISIS comes along. And for the past three years, you see all these newspaper articles about how Christianity is about to be wiped out. From, but this is the nature of Islam. It's crushing. It's devouring. It devours with its teeth. And then even what's left, it tries to erase and destroy and devour. And what's interesting is that that is the, the description of this fourth kingdom. Now, the Roman Empire, to be clear, it was a brutal military uh, you know, the Roman, the Roman military was brutal, but by and large in, in history, it was a very tolerant empire. It was a largely a very tolerant empire because the whole purpose of the Roman Empire was revenue collection. They wanted to sit back in Rome, sit back in their little seaside condominiums, eat way more than they should, have all kinds of perverted sexual stuff, and then pay for everyone else to go out and fight their wars in the provinces and send all the taxes back to Rome so we can eat more and become more perverse and throw up and eat more. That was the Roman Empire. It was a giant revenue collection vacuum. They built smooth roads so that the money can come back to Rome. And then very quickly, they start outsourcing their military and so forth. But by and large, it was actually a very tolerant empire. They allowed the Roman, they allowed the Jews to what? They had their temple. They, had, they were allowed to practice their religion. You know, there was the exceptions for these ancient religions. And, you know, as long as you sort of tipped your hat to Caesar and made sacrifices, sent back the taxes and so forth. But they didn't just go out and level cities. That's exactly what the Islamic Empire did. They came in, they would raise cities, march 30 to 50,000 women back to Mecca as slaves, and then they would just take the booty like pirates. I mean, it's a very, they're two very different empires. And you go, which one meets the biblical descriptions? Which one matches the biblical criteria? And I go, on all points, the Islamic Empire matches the geographic criteria. Today, if the Islamic Empire were fully revived, and the rock came back and crushed that statue on its feet, which is the revived element of that empire. Would Babylon, Medo-Persia, and Greece all be destroyed at the same time? Yes, absolutely, completely, 100%. If the Roman Empire, 
the European Union were fully revived today, and the Christ came back and destroyed that kingdom, would Babylon, Medo-Persia, and Greece all be destroyed? The answer is not really. Maybe a quarter of them? Unless he's just saying that the whole world's going to get destroyed at the same, but that's not really what it's pointing to, because it makes the same point a few times. Again, the Islamic Empire meets the biblical descriptions. The Roman Empire, you kind of have to force it to fit. It's just the realities of history and the realities of what the text says don't really align. We'd like it to, because we want to make you know traditionalism, we want to defend traditionalism, but when we're really just weighing the options, one fits clearly and the other one doesn't. Finally, uh, we'll just end with the picture of the um, statue. I would suggest, as we began, that indeed the head of gold, as Daniel stated very clearly, is Nebuchadnezzar. Then came the Medo-Persian Empire. Then came the Greek Alexandrian Empire. The next empire that meets the, the criteria, and we could go on into a whole bunch of other elements within the text. Um, there's actually several other pretty important criteria that the empire that meets that description is the Islamic empire. And then it says that there's elsewhere in the scriptures in Revelation, it says that that empire would sort of suffer a fatal head wound. It would appear to die, but then it comes back as a revived version of that empire. And I believe that in our day right now, I believe we're seeing the revival of that historical Islamic empire. We see calls throughout the Islamic world for the revival of the caliphate. That's the Islamic government. Just a couple days ago in um, a prominent Turkish newspaper, you have really high-ranking Turkish officials close to the president calling him the caliph. Now, what was the empire that died that suffered the head wound? The Ottoman Empire, 1923. The caliph, the caliphate was abolished. Mustafa Kemal Ataturk abolished that thing. And it's been the past, you know, 90 years that the Islamic world has been crying out, knowing that Islamic law demands the establishment of the caliphate in order to implement Islamic law. And that cry is rising from throughout the Islamic world. ISIS was a failed attempt. But I believe that in the, possibly the days nearly ahead, there will be a successful attempt that will have a much more moderate, immediate appearance or a slightly more powerful, respectable appearance. You know, but let's just be honest, guys. The, the Ro Roman Empire, the European Union, that thing's not coming back. That thing's falling apart. They're talking about that whole thing imploding. And so, again, to be clear, I'm not dogmatic on this. I think we need to have men on the Western Wall, watchmen, men on the Eastern Wall, watchmen. We need to consider all of these things, keep our eyes open, to be prayerful. But I strongly suspect that what we are seeing unfold right now is indeed the fulfillment of biblical prophecy in, in front of us. And so the hour is close. Uh, let us therefore be about the business of God. Let us be about the work of God. And let us be zealous for the proclamation of the gospel to snatch as many out of the fire as possible, to complete the great commission, and to repent daily and to stand before him because indeed the day of the Lord is at hand. Amen? Amen. Amen.